Hi, I'm Josh Bonnet, a creative director based at Hillsong Church here in Sydney, and I'd like to welcome you to part two of this series on ideas and execution. In the first part, we covered finding and articulating your objective, which creates a lane for you to run in, and then we talked about ideas and how to find them and develop them. Now I'd like to move on to talking about successfully pitching your ideas and start the conversation about execution and excellence. So the pitch, when you work in a team and there's an idea to be had and then executed, there's definitely gonna be stakeholders that need to green light that idea. You'll need to convince someone to invest in you or invest in that idea. Time, resources, space on the run sheet and the platform, all those things hold great value and they're not given away lightly. When it comes to the pitch, what's more important, the idea or the person sort of selling it, I suppose, or, or pitching it? It's kind of both. But if you don't pitch an idea well, it, it usually won't get a green light. If we jump out of the church and ministry world for a bit and jump into the world of advertising, people refer to an elevator pitch. So you have to imagine you're in the elevator, the boss gets in or with you on level one, you've got a couple of floors before she gets out, that's the time you've got to pitch. So what are you saying? I think sometimes we go to pitch an idea and we've sort of got all of our references and we also have thought about our catering and we've thought about this and we've thought about that and it's just so long, people get a little bit lost. But if you're gonna do like an elevator pitch, that's a quick one. It's like a couple of minutes or a minute and people will wanna know things like what the objective is, what the fresh idea is that achieves that purpose, maybe what other people think about it or who you've spoken to or, or filtered it through and then whether or not it's doable. But before they answer all of those questions, people also wanna know if they can trust you to pull it off and you earn trust over time. So with your pitch, you might have a one minute and a five minute version or something like that, but have something short, sharp and clean ready, but also lots of supporting information. Most of the content in what would be described as a creative brief is like the supporting documents. So you might have a sketch of a stage design, you might have what the costumes will look like and all those sorts of detail. But first of all, you just need to actually pitch the idea. So be confident, understand who you're talking to and also what's important to them. You don't need to unfold all of the giant amount of detail until you've got them on board with the idea. If someone was pitching for me, just like, I'm not gonna buy an idea because I like the way you've considered your occupational health and safety issues around your event or your beautiful catering budget or all of that sort of stuff. I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy it or I'm gonna say yes to it if I feel like it's gonna work for me and the purposes of the event we're trying to, a vision we're trying to achieve, and if I feel like I can trust you to pull it off. When we're pitching, be ready to have your idea challenged. Like if someone asks you one or two curly questions or basic questions about execution and delivery and they catch you off guard with that because you haven't thought of it, that's a shame because it might be a great idea, but they're just not sure how you'll pull it off. So they're looking for how can we, uh, is this gonna be a guaranteed outcome? So before you get into the pitch, poke holes in your ideas, get a bit cynical about it. Completely different to the brainstorming meeting where the world is your oyster and blue sky dreaming and all that sort of stuff. Now you need to get together with the people who maybe in your team are the problem solvers or they good at finding holes in things, or oh, that's not gonna work, or how's that gonna flow, or what? Like poke holes in it, don't let it die, <laughs> but get ready to interrogate that idea a little bit. How is it different from what we rolled out last year? Does it fit within the vision of everything we're doing? If we only get half the budget that we thought we had, what are we gonna do? Get a bit ruthless with your idea and see if it stands up still. Now, when it comes to preparing a brief, look, some people spend six weeks preparing their brief and it's so comprehensive, it details everything. I don't, for just the documents I do, I don't have much of a template <laughs> which might not be very helpful, but I like to fit the documents for purpose. So let's say I'm pitching something to my leader, Cass Langton. Sometimes it's verbal. Sometimes it's with a few fun images. Other times it's a fully fledged script document. It depends on what the event is and what I think we've found out in advance that she might be looking for. But I'd rather pitch with one or two killer images and a great understanding of how the event fits the purpose that she's looking for then detail it all in an email and read it all out and there's budgets and everything. I like pitching and I like being excited about an idea and getting someone else to be excited about it. I feel really excited when an idea I know is gonna fulfill the objective and that's, that's what I feel is, is the clincher. If you can walk in the door and say, hey, you said you wanted to achieve this, we've got these two or three ideas, I think it's gonna be really great and we've worked out it's doable, are you on board? And once you get that initial yes or that initial green light, then you can go more into development. I have been known to break all the rules and do a pre-pitch 
where I get an idea and then I just get really excited and I ring everyone involved before the actual pitching meeting, but that's okay. <laughs> just break the rules a bit, can't help it. But you want to get people excited and you want people's buy-in. So it also needs to be an idea that people can contribute to and people can shape and change because it might be the most brilliant idea in the world, but if it's all yours and no one else has contributed at all, you'll find when you get it through into the execution stage, there isn't as much buy-in. People are not really interested in working with that. People want to play a part. Another reason I like to initially pitch without too much sort of locked in documentation is you can stay flexible. So it doesn't mean you don't do all the work of thoroughly thinking everything through, what your heroes might be, the preparation, is it doable, can we afford it, all that sort of stuff. But let's say for example, we were in a meeting the other day and the team had worked on a big opener and it was actually brilliant, a great story, great visuals, really well articulated. We'd all been over the brief four or five times. But in the meeting, the leader of the meeting at the beginning said, I'm not sure we're hunting for a big opener this year. So I knew later on in the meeting we were gonna be pitching that big opener. So I left it to the end of our pitch thing, but I still pitched it and I said, look, I, we may not be hunting for a big opener, but this is a great story here. But what had ended up happening was because we'd done all the work of thinking through the idea well, she was able to take the, some of the ideas out of that opener and put it into other parts of the conference in smaller bits. Now we may not do it, but, but we're able to pitch it in that way. The idea can still move forward. It just gets developed and used differently or you shelve it for the future. But until you've pitched it and had it green lighted, you need to stay flexible in your approach and your attitude towards it. So. It's a bit disheartening if you spend six months developing an idea before you pitch it and then you find out you're not aiming in the right direction. So try not to do that. Try, try and have several layers of pitching along the way where you get something green lighted in the early stages as a direction to hunt. If you hold ideas loosely, they'll flow. But remember, the most important thing is not the idea itself, it's the objective and then how the idea serves that vision. Ultimately, everyone ends up celebrating the idea, but it's the underlying objective that I think has an impact on people. Also. If someone doesn't like your idea in a pitch meeting, I think it's really important to ask, respectfully ask, ask why. Have the courage to ask why, because that really helps you go away and do better. So, you know, I understand you don't like the idea. I kind of thought we really were on par with the objective or I, I thought we were bringing you something that you like. Could you just help me out with a bit more of an explanation about why you don't like it? Now, it could be that it looks a lot like something that we saw last year and you didn't know that, or it could be they've had conversations with other people that they've forgotten to pass on about why that won't work this year. Whatever it is, it's gonna help set you up to go away and come back with a better idea and point you in the right direction. Now, moving on from the whole initial objective and ideation and pitching stage, let's talk about execution. What's better, a reasonable idea executed brilliantly or a crazy brilliant idea that is executed at just an okay level? I think you have to judge that for yourself, but I like both. But I do think that when it comes to like a moment, poor execution or execution that could have been better and a lack of like finesse, especially on things like transitions, I think people can disengage from the moment. And I think people start to watch how a moment is being executed as opposed to enjoying the actual moment itself. It's not about chasing perfection. We'll never get there. It's a lovely ideal, but it's about, for me, when it comes to execution, I really don't want people to be allowed to get distracted from experiencing it. When it comes to your team as well, people want to be part of something that's executed well. People want to be part of something that's successful. That might sound like really common sense, but in your, if you're leading a moment or directing a moment, one of the things that I like to think in my head is, how can we make this a win for all of the teams, where all the teams might have stretched a little bit more than they have before, but within a healthy boundary and they all love and celebrate what we've done. Wins create wins. It's about making the whole process as enjoyable as you can for everyone. Celebrate your wins, create community along the way, validate and thank people, give people an opportunity to stretch and try new things and be successful at them. And I think those people will be there for you the next time. Excellence is something that we all love to chase in all areas of our life. Years ago, I read an interesting article in the Harvard Business Review and the author referred to a study where they had interviewed thousands of different professionals, athletes and musicians, people who were very, very excellent in a particular skill, and they were looking for commonality amongst all of them. And they found six things. Um, I thought it was a helpful list, so 
I thought I'd share it with you. The first key that they identified to being excellent at something is to pursue what you love. The second one would be do the hardest work first. I thought that was interesting when it comes to creatives and I guess with a creative director or producer hat on, sometimes when we start out trying to direct a moment, we probably come at it with one or two special skills that we've had as an individual creative. So for example, you might be a vocalist or a dancer or lighting, or you might be great at making costumes or a musician. When you come to direct a moment or when you come to be involved in producing a piece of creativity, it's tempting to do the easiest stuff. So if I know music really well, and if I know vocals really well, I might go there first. And I might put lots of my energy into that side of things. But that can mean that you leave other teams without direction or import or without guideposts to go on. So for example, dancers, if you think, oh, that's a foreign language to me, you might just sort of leave them to it, but that, they'll need direction. They'll need guideposts from you as well if you're directing a moment. And so do the hardest work first. I think that applies in, in that area for us. I kind of would force myself when first starting out to, I'm not gonna go with the things that are really natural to me. I'm gonna try and put mental energy and briefing and discussion into the bits that are unfamiliar to me to set those teams flying, then I can come back and do the stuff that I find easy, right? So pursue what you love, do the hardest work first. Um, the third thing they found was that people who are excellent at something, they practice intensely for short periods. They seek expert feedback, but the feedback needs to be sort of simple and precise so you can do something about it. Uh, they take regular breaks and they ritualize practice is the last one. And I thought this one was interesting as well. The author described that will and discipline and self-control are kind of wildly overrated. And when you're talking about Olympic athletes that you sort of think, oh, they all get up at 4 a.m. every morning, they must have so much discipline and so much will. In their investigations with people, they kind of figured out it's not so much that, it's that they've put rituals in their life that keep them on track. So I wonder for us as creatives, what can we do to counteract maybe our lack of will or lack of discipline. And I'm not saying creatives have less of that stuff than anyone else. I'm just saying, I know myself, if I need to get something done, the best thing I can do is just create a moment in my day, every day where I work on it. There's a difference between excellence and perfection. And, you know, I am a bit of a perfectionist. I know that about myself, but I think a perfect moment, you can spend your life chasing that and you're never gonna get there. But excellence is when you tick the box. And something I've learned to do over the years is when you've worked on making a moment, you get it the best you can in rehearsals or you're about to send the film out or whatever the piece of creativity is, you just have to let it go and let it achieve what it needs to achieve. And if it's not as perfect as it could have been, but it still ticks the box on the objective, celebrate that. And so I, I enjoy that. I enjoy that about the moments that I'm part of. I don't like to sit down and pick it apart as it's happening about, oh, that could have been better and that could have been better and that could have been better. Because it takes away all the enjoyment of what you've probably worked on for weeks and months to get there. You do the best with the team that you've got. You do the best with the self that you've got and then you let it be what it needs to be. All right, well, there's a lot more we can focus on there, but in the next part of this series, we're gonna talk about rehearsals and directing people's attention.